Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Going on from our last talk and discussion, Hussein ibn Ali Salamullah Alayhi in his epic dua, the dua of Arafah, he recites a particular dua. It's a culmination it's a culmination of his dua on that day before the addition is added on and we speculate it may be from Imam Hussein. But in any case, the one that we have as a sort of narrated dua from Imam Hussein, at the end of his long dua, he comes out with this statement. He says, Oh Allah, give me that. If after that you were to refuse me everything, it is as if you have given me everything and you have not refused me anything. And O oh Allah, save me from that. If after that, you were not to save me from any other calamity, it is as if you have saved me from every calamity. He says, O oh Allah, grant me paradise and free me from the fire of hell. Now here our minds may not comprehend that how can he complete his dua, which is an epic dua, with such a sentiment and such a statement. The only reason that we fail to understand is because we don't understand the nature of paradise and hell that Hussein ibn Ali is talking about. And what he feels before his Lord, when he empties his soul and he sees the nature of existence as it is, and he sees the relationship that he has with his God. If we turn to Dua Kumail, Ali ibn Abi Talib expresses hell in a way that is intolerable. He does not talk about paradise. He talks about the trauma, the torment, and the tribulation of hell. But he culminates that particular sentiment of being traumatized in the fire of hell if he were to be placed there culminates in this statement in which he reflects and he says, Oh Allah, but even if you were to place me amongst the inmates of hell, even if I were to be able to withstand its horrors and its torture, O oh Lord, even then I will not be able to withstand your indifference to me and your separation from me. This is the sentiment that Hussein ibn Ali is displaying in his Dua Arafah. Hell is not merely the psychological trauma and the physical burning. It is a spiritual separation from God. It is a sort of separation in which the son of Adam feels nothingness. A total state of void and loss. Imagine in this world when we are going through a traumatic time but when we have hope that tomorrow will bring something better, or we have hope, and that is the rope of God, that I can hold on to this hope, and God is with me, everyone has abandoned me, but oh Allah, you are still with me. That rope of God is there. We are able to come through this trauma, even if psychologically we are burdened, we are traumatized. Even then there is a flicker of hope that I am with my God. Imagine now, if that rope were to be severed, then what? If that hope were to go, then what? Then it's a state of dire loss. This is what Ali sees, that fine, this hell is so overbearing. I can so not handle this hell. I cannot withstand its heat or a moment of it. But, O oh Lord, even then, I shall hold on to this hope that I call my friend, that I call my intimate companion, the one that I can cry to. But, O oh Allah, what will happen to me when I know that now there is no one who is listening to me? No one that I can cry on to. No one I can turn towards and say, Ya Allah, O oh Lord, what would that state be like? How would I ever be able to withstand that state? At least in the burning I will still have you to cry to, to complain to, to lament to, to hope for. But O oh Lord, 
if that rope were to be severed, if you were to turn your face away, if your glances were no longer upon me, if your listening ear were to be taken away, O oh Lord, if you not, did not keep me worthy of mentioning your name, that my tongue could not possibly utter the name of the one that I've loved, then, O oh Lord, how will I be able to withstand that tor tro torment? This is what Hussein ibn Ali is trying to convey in his Dua Arafah. O oh Lord, save me from that. If after that you involve me in every difficulty and calamity, it is as if you have saved me from everything. Save me from the fires of hell. For the fires of hell are not physical burning. They are not psychological trauma. They are the severing of the tie with you. And O oh Lord, give me that. If after that you were to deny me everything, it is as if you have given me everything. Give me paradise. That paradise for Hussein is not paradise of the brides, of the flowing rivers, of the trees. It's the paradise of companionship, intimate belonging with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think about this very, very carefully. The way in which we love in this world, it goes beyond paradise. We do not need to set forth examples of a mystical nature. We can introspect and look within ourselves. When we fall deeply in love with our children, no palace will yield satisfaction without our children. If we love our mothers, then that paradise is not a paradise in which the love of my heart is not found. Who has any cause with gardens and trees? and flowing rivers and brides, when the heart feels the trauma of the loss of a beloved, do you find any food satiating at that point? Do you even look at anybody? Do you even think of the riches? Imagine when a loved one dies, how blackened this world becomes, does it not? At once the glory of the world disappears. It is only after the fading of this love that the world reacquires its beauty in our esteem, in our eyes and gains esteem. Is it not so? If we were to lose our child, in an instance the world will become a blackened and a darkened place. It will have no beauty, no charm. Our heart is not in there. The walls are the same walls. They glitter as they always did, but the glitter within has gone. So paradise is not even paradise without the touch of the beloved. So what Hussein is asking for here is, is that intimate companionship and belonging with God. If I have that, O oh Lord, if after that you were to deny me everything, it is as if you have given me everything. It is like a mother who looks at the child and the child stands again from a sickness that would have taken him. You observe the tears in the eyes of the mother the mother has spent all her savings. And the child comes and says, Oh mother, what can I do for you in return for everything that you've spent on me? She will say, Oh child, just be with me for as long as I am alive. Don't die before me. For you are the love of my life. Everything for you can be sacrificed in an instance. This is the sentiment that Hussein ibn Ali displays. And this is the sentiment that Ali ibn Abi Talib displayed in his Dua Kumail. So when we call on to God, what we are calling on to fundamentally is that inner security, inner fulfillment, inner contentment, inner companionship and inner love and inner bonding. It is not so difficult to understand. Think about this carefully. If you were to possess the world, even after that the heart will still be yearning. What is this yearning for, I ask? You have the kingdom of Suleiman. Why are you still yearning? But I haven't found my treasure yet. But who is your treasure? My treasure is beyond it all. He is beyond gold and silver. He is beyond the brides of paradise. He is the one who satisfies my soul. That is your true belonging. How beautifully our mystics have said and our masters have said that in the face of Layla, you are wishing to glance upon the beauty of the creator of Layla. 
in the glitter of gold and silver. You are after the ending, unending treasure that, have given, that has given glitter to gold and silver. If only you knew what you were after. So when we call on to God, we are saying, Ya Allah, O oh my companion, O oh the love of my heart, O oh the one who cares for me, O oh the one with whom I am at ease, O oh the one who I know cares for me more than I care for myself, O oh the one who knows me more than I know myself. Is it so difficult to understand? That when we know that there is someone who loves us more than we love ourselves, who has an ending control, who has an ending treasures, who knows what is better for me than I do myself, is it then so difficult for me to yearn him? Think about this carefully. So when we ask God for things, we are merely crying out for the real thing. That, O oh Lord, I am asking these things from you, but you do know very well that I am asking for you through them. How strange that we fail to understand this. We ask God for security, whereas God says, I am the security. We ask God for treasures. He says, I am the treasure. We ask him for life. He says, I am the life. We ask him for children. He says, I am the love that you find in them. We ask him for everything. And he says, I am everything. If only you knew. Think about this very, very carefully. It does not befit me to ask my God for anything less than my God. Even after I have everything, I will still say, Ya Allah, I need you. For even after having everything, the emptiness still persists and prevails upon my being. So the philosophy of dua, as explained by the blessed prophet and his family, is that we yearn God from God. But the prophet knew very well that these little children do not understand God. So the prophet instead prescribed that whatever you do, yearn God in that. So he said, when you pick up a stick, say, O oh Allah, allow me to pick up this stick. Imam Zain al Abidin taught, he said, when you breathe the breath, and before breathing another one, say, O oh Allah, allow me to breathe the next breath, so that you may understand that the breaths are unceasing. He has given you them in any case, but you are the one who is in need of him and not the breaths. Of what good is that breath? through which you do not draw near to him. Imagine, if God were to give us unending breaths, and through them we were distant from him. How beautiful Imam Hussein conveys this sentiment. He says, O oh Lord, how can I now, at this point, find any excuse for whatever I have done against you? How I have transgressed against my soul and against you? O oh Lord, and through which means should I come close to you? O oh Lord, did you not give me these hands as a bestowal? And O oh Lord, did I not then through them act against you? O oh Lord, did you not give me this tongue as a favor? Did I not then utter words that were displeasing to you? O oh Lord, how can I come through this tongue towards you? My eyes, my limbs, everything that you bestowed upon me, which of it should I make my means towards you? O oh Lord, at the end of it I do not find anything within me worthy of approaching you. I approach you through my state of need to you. So when we ask God for things, what will we ask for? Think about this carefully. What will we ask for? Our analogy is like a student who is sitting inside the examination room. The teacher says, ask for everything that you want. So we say, I want a pencil. I want a sharpener. I want a pen. I want a ruler. I want an iPad. I want this. I want that. I want this. The teacher is baffled. 
The teacher is saying, but aren't you going to ask me to assist you in answering the questions? Aren't you a little lost in what you're doing right now? Well, carry on asking me. Now I've given you the pencil, the pen, the book, everything I've given you. Now shall you awaken to the fact that you have half an hour left to answer this paper and ask me to help you to answer it? Don't you know what lies beyond giving this paper? It's your future, your destiny. Have you forgotten that? Don't you want me to help you with your destiny? This is an hour's examination. In that hour's examination, all you had to do was to ask me to sit next to you, to be your companion, to pose the questions to me, and for me to help you to answer them. And for them, and after that, an hour, you find your release, and you find your huge success. But you still haven't woken. 45 minutes have gone. I'm still sharpening your pencils. Salawat. After all, I am a Mawlana. When Mawlana makes a good point, there has to be a salawat, right? So, uh, Alhamdulillah, we are awake. So from Allah, the Prophet said, ask him. Ask him for everything. The intention was that when you ask him, that you awaken to the fact that, oh Allah, I never asked you for the sun. You cause it to rise every morning. Oh Allah. I never asked you for the sustenance within the bosom of my mother. You provided it for me. O oh Allah, I have never asked you for the breaths of air. You have given them to me. O oh Allah, I never asked you for health. You always gave it to me. O oh Allah, in every state you've looked after me. When have I ever needed to ask you? As Hussein says, O oh Allah, you have taken care of me so well that before the arising of the need, you have seen to it. When you have taken care of me so well in my yesterday, shall you abandon me in my tomorrow if you will it to come and you keep me alive? O oh Allah, therefore allow me to give myself over to you wholeheartedly. So ask Allah, indeed ask Allah. But our asking should not be in a way that God becomes a middleman from whom we earn things. Isn't that where we've placed God? He has become a middleman, hasn't he? He is that point that we refer to to do our things. He's like a secretary for us. A'udhu billah. Na'udhu billah. Isn't, isn't that what God has become? Oh Allah, do this for me. Allah, do that for me. Allah, do this for me. Allah, do that for me. And then look at our prayers. Because they are wajib, I'm praying. Oh Allah, I wish you never made your prayer wajib. Break this idol of wajib. Let the lover come to you, O oh Allah, wholeheartedly. Let me worship you without you asking me to worship you. O oh Lord, let me love you enough that you don't have to make it wajib on me to come and offer the symbols of bowing and prostrating in front of you, O oh Lord. Allow me, I beg you, to adorn my forehead with the dust of humility for you. This is where you are for me, O my Lord. O Lord, do not make zakat wajib on me. Allow me to give and to feel a little bit of pride that I've done a little bit. It's all yours, O Allah, as Hussein says. O God, what sort of a God are you? You give before I ask. After you give, you ask for a little back. With a heavy heart, I give a little in your way. Smilingly, you accept. You multiply it 70 times over and give it all back to me. O oh Allah, when was it never yours that I'm giving it back to you? O oh God, take away this wajib. Let me beg you to allow me to give in your way. Let me beg you to allow me to make my tongue worthy, even if it's not worthy, at least allow it to pronounce your name. Oh, my beloved. Oh, my Allah. Oh, my all. My beginning. My end. Oh, my light. My parent. My friend. My master. 
my, my cave to which I run. Oh, my shade, oh, my all. Oh, Lord, allow me to come running to you. Now tell me. We ask Allah, oh, Allah, defeat my enemies. I always ask Allah to convert them into my followers, by the way, just for record's sake. Yeah. I don't think you get the subtleties, do you? Even the shaitan, you know, there is, shaitan is still awake and he's not altogether chained. There's some levels of shaitan that are chained in Ramadan, you know. But the religious shaitans are never chained. They always pop in a nice little thought. Oh Allah, overpower my enemies. Is that the prayer we make? Or is it the prayer that, oh Allah, rid me of fear through yourself? Is this the power do we make, oh Allah, destroy them? Or should we make the prayer that the Prophet made, O oh Allah, they are ignorant, bear with them. Let them acquire your light. Should we say oh, to Allah, oh Allah, give me millions? <laughs> or should we say it like Hussein said, O oh Allah, when I have you, what do I lack? Somebody asked me, and I'm finishing, that the people who are affluent do not need to ask. I said, no. Their test is the greatest test. At least a person with pens of hunger in there will say, Oh Allah, feed me. And they will come that step closer to God. A person who does not have pens of hunger in his belly is deprived of that opportunity at times. The people who are affluent are tested more by Allah to say that all of this does not avail me from my state of poverty. And I rejoice an abdan luck that oh Allah that I am a slave of yours. Look at the pride Muhammad Rasulullah takes. There is no one greater than him on the face of this earth. But what brings a joy to his heart is that every follower of his first says, I bear witness that Muhammad is your slave in tashahud. So should we say to Allah, oh Allah, grant me your treasures? Or should we say to Allah, oh Allah, rid this heart of the distraction of the want of this world. Allow me to come running to you. I'm going to finish on this note today, because the time has finished. <clears throat> that we need to ask Allah for things we do. Do you know why? Because that brings Allah closer to us. When we are sick, we need to pray to Allah because we express our state of inability to God. Look at the way Ali eloquently expresses this. اغفر لمن لا يملك إلا دعاء والسلاحه بكاء Forgive the one who does not have but a prayer in his ownership and who has only one weapon and that weapon is pleading to you and crying to you. Allah says about the Anbiya, kharru sujjadan wa bukiya. They fall prostrating and crying and lamenting. When God's beauty dawns upon the heart and His majesty prevails, the heart trembles and the slavehood and the state of slavery and nothingness prevails. And that is the state where we need to be. And then we call on to him, Ya Allah. My final point here is that when we pray to Allah, by all means pray to him. But with this proviso, that O oh Allah, if you decide otherwise, then allow me to have trust in you that I surrender to your discretion wholeheartedly. That is the proviso with which make, we make prayers. Oh Allah, do this for me, do that for me. But oh Allah, if you have decided otherwise, you being you, the parent of all parent, the friend of all friend, the love of all love, the master of all masters, my intimate companion, if you have decided otherwise, then allow me to wholeheartedly accept what you have decreed for me. This is what Hussein said. Now look at those people who are godly. 
Ali Salamullah Ali is struck in his mehrab. There are two or three things he says. Look at how present he is. First he says, Fustu wa Rabbil Kaaba. I have succeeded. That I have not put a foot wrong. I have been aligned with God until death came upon me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not allow me to go astray. At that point when the sword descends upon his blessed head, the only thing that is consuming him is him and his God. Imagine. Then he takes the dust and he places the dust upon his head, upon his wound. And he recites the verse, Minha khalaqnakum, fiha nu'idukum, wa minha nukhrijukum taratan ukhra. From it we have created you. To it we shall cause you to return. And from it we shall raise you once again. Look at this great man. How he is with his Lord. But his greatness truly becomes manifest when he opens his eyes in the lap of his son Al-Hassan. As Hassan's tears flood from his eyes, and they descend upon the face of Ali. He opens his eyes. And he sees Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim being brought in front of him. He looks at him. He says, Oh Hassan, untie your captive. They say, But he is your assassin. They say, Do you not see how the color of his face has changed? Do you not see how petrified he is from the fear of death? Untie him at once. He looks at Abdul Rahman, he said, Was I not a good Imam for you? Abdul Rahman replies, O oh Ali, can you save one whose calling is towards hell? Imam Ali looks at Hassan. He says, By my right over you, give him to drink what you drink for yourselves. Give him to eat what you eat for yourselves. Do not torment him. If I live, then I shall decide whether to pardon him or to strike him. If I die, it is your right, him to, it is your right to strike him. When they are taking him towards his house, he looks towards the heavens. He says, O Lord, bear, O, o heavens, bear witness. You have not found Ali sleeping at this time. He has never been on his back. He has always stood in the devotion of his Lord. إمامنا المنتظر واجعلنا من أنساره وعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه رحم الله من قرى الفاتحة